So good morning, afternoon or evening to everybody, wherever you're joining us in the world. Um, and welcome to the University of Derby and the University of Essex has jointly organised and hosted celebration for International Open Access Week 2023, fully embracing the community theme this year. So this is the first of five events that are taking place each day of the week. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up for any of the others, then please do. There's still plenty of time to do so. Um, thank you all very much for your interest and for signing up for today's event. We are extremely grateful to Dr. Benny Wickham for agreeing to speak today um, and for her giving up her valuable time. Just a few things to note before we kick off the event. If you could keep your microphones turned off, as I say, if you'd like to keep your cameras on, then that's fine. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please post in the Q&A. I think Benny's going to break potentially halfway through her presentation for a bit of discussion. So, you know, we can um, get to that then. But if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll hopefully have time at the end as well to address those questions. Um, we will be monitoring the chat. So if there are any technical issues or things of that, of that nature, please post in the chat and we'll address anything that comes up. Um, you can enable closed captions in Teams by clicking on the three dots at the top of the screen. And then if you scroll down to language and speech um, captions, then turn on live captions. This session is being recorded and will be sent out post event to everyone that registered, including, including those who haven't been able to join us today. Um, and the U University of Derby and the University of Essex are committed to providing a friendly, respectful and welcoming environment for everybody and to ensure um, a harassment free experience for all. So we do request that people are treated with dignity and respect. If you're tweeting about the event, please use the hashtag Open Access Week 23. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker. So Benny holds a BA from Tufts University, an MSc from University College London and a PhD in molecular physics from Linköping University. Hopefully I've pronounced that right um, in Sweden with over 15 years experience in academia and industry. Now as the founder and CEO of SciFree, she is building teams and software with a mission to make highly vetted peer reviewed research open to the public for three. Um, through empowering the university library's brand. SciFi currently serves 45 university library customers in Sweden, Denmark, the UK and the USA. Um, and besides building new tech platforms for university publishing infrastructure, Benny volunteers on the NASIG Digital Preservation <laughs> Committee, holds PhD students, sorry, helps PhD students transition in their careers and enjoys surfing both actual waves <laughs> And the open access wave worldwide. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Benny. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Holly, and thank you, University of Derby and University of Essex for putting this on. Um, I'll just start sharing uh, my uh, screen and then we'll get through. So uh, Holly, just let me know that everything is full and it's okay. Looking good, thank you. Wonderful. So I wanted to, so thank you again, everyone. And it's uh, Monday morning. So I hope you had a wonderful weekend. And um, my name is Abeni Wickham, as, as Holly mentioned. So the agenda is that we're going to just check in quickly because it's the start of the week. And then we're going to talk about value in terms of the fundamental reasons for pain in academia or what we think. And then together, we'll try to figure out <laughs> this wonderful Monday morning, the future about what we want, love, are good at and get rewarded for. So if you'd permit me, because we're just starting out for the day, if you permit me to just let us land. And what I want to do is a brief exercise. Either you can close your eyes or you can look at this video here, however you feel most comfortable and is available to you. And if you could just breathe normally and think within yourself, I'll ask you a question. Why are we here? Just think within yourselves for a few moments. Maybe you have an answer, so I'll ask it again. Why are you really, really here?
Of course, we'll think about that some more as we go along, but I like to do these exercises before the marathon of a presentation just to get us to take a step back from all that's going on around us and be here together with each other. So just a bit about Cyfree, as Holly mentioned, we when we wrote that out in July, so we had about 45 customers, now we serve 50 customers, but who are we if you've never heard of us? Um, this is us and the team, so it's me, um, a researcher turned founder CEO, you can just call me a Benny, I, I would really prefer that. So this is us and the team, so we're a librarian, we were established in Stockholm, Sweden in 2018, we're a librarian, and like five or more DevOps uh, developers that have done bigger things with larger automations for larger companies over the while. Um, and what we really do is that we sit down with library customers and we create solutions that didn't exist before. So for example, the journal search tool uh, where researchers can find um, who is paying for their journals and how with these open access agreements under what licenses at the time when we launched this in 2021, 2020, sorry, um, you had multiple license options and researchers didn't understand. So basically explaining all of that, the different publishing models. And what we saw over the last three years with the universities using this tool is that the libraries and the researchers started connecting and researchers started realizing how much work the libraries were doing for them in open access, which is really nice and also reducing the number of emails that get to the library about is my journal covered, you know? And then in terms of um, publishing, we have Dynamica, we've launched with, uh, with a few universities, with Stockholm University, it's one of our main marquee customers and it's no paying to read or publish university infrastructure publishing, publishes all content from philosophy all the way to uh, physics and so on. But I I'm not really here to promote Cyfree and our services, but I guess you should know what we do. Um, one of the things of the real story of building Cyfree and making all these new platforms um, or making these platforms and services is the truth of the story, which is that we at Cyfree did something which apparently we didn't realize that wasn't so obvious is that we listened and then built these solutions. So when I first started in 2018, we got the grant to build Dynamica and I, we were building Dynamica. And I went to the university customers about it and they said to me, quite frankly, like, Benny, this is great. In three years, we'll need this, three, four years, but we have a problem now, can you solve it? And at the time I didn't know the journal search tool, what it would be, it wasn't anything. It was just, I just got a bunch of um, Excel lists and they told me, turn this, they're like, make this easier for researchers. <laughs> that, was, that was our mandate. So we ended up building it. And then we saw that it was a lot of steps if we wanted to revolutionize academic publishing from my perspective, coming as an academic, there were steps that we needed to take and there's steps that we needed to understand. So now that's back in 2020, we're in 2023. And I feel like, I don't know about you, but I feel in my core that this is the moment for change. And I don't know if it's because of all the different policies, if it's because of UNESCO, we know that. We know in Latin America has always been 100% open access. They've had that. You have the United Kingdom have their rights retention policies that have, that have been launched or will be launched in the next couple of months. You have the in the USA, the Office of Science uh, Technology Policy talking about the OSTP memo about immediate and open access with no embargoes and things like that, the Nelson memo. And then, of course, you have the EU Plan S and so on. But then you also have the libraries that have been supporting for ages with their open access agreements, for example, their repositories for green open access, their data management protocols, their FAIR principles, everything is there. There's nothing really that new, uh, so to speak, other than higher level policies, but it's all there. So my question for us this morning is, you know, as we go forward in the rest of the week, like what is really holding us back or what is holding back that momentum? Some say it's money, budget concerns. I've heard that, you know, I could understand um, at both personally and professionally when it is difficult to innovate and put resources for that innovation to thrive when you're concerned about budgets and things are shifting all the time. I, I understand that it, it can be really hard. Um, maybe there's apprehensions from research and libraries about better the pain you already know, like we already know academic publishing is X, 
Do we want to go into something else where it might be different? I don't know. There, there is something holding us back. And I hope by the end of this week that we will know what it is and be able to tackle it. As I mentioned, as we're going to go forward after the next two slides, we're going to, I'm going to open up for us to just chat about these things. So what we did at Cyfree before we started building all these quote unquote innovative solutions and, and things like that is that we did a lot of surveys. Um, more than, I think there were like six or seven surveys with more than 200 people or more. We asked about similar questions and things like that. We also did like a, a full Excel sheet with over a thousand, 500 different business models, a thousand different articles about the system. Where we just tried to figure out like what's, what's really painful, what's really happening uh, uh, quantitative, quantitatively. And what we saw, we all know this, I don't need to tell you, cost to publish. I mean, paying to publish, uh, paying back for access for university, 6% increase every year, paying for color images, for a digital print, you know, things like that, we, we know that. But the fragmentation is also something that's causing, costing us a lot of money. You know, there are 33,000 journals in STEM alone. Um, how do we even keep updated with our with our field when there's so many new journals coming out? Everybody's saying something new. So there's not much cohesion. The time to review, even for researchers, like that, that process, the review process is really cumbersome um, and very painful and can take a very long time. And there are full websites talking about for each journal how long it takes to review and things like that. It's a huge problem. Um, the no visibility, it seems like if the university brand or the researcher's work is secondary to the publisher's brand. So, for example, if I'm at a university that doesn't have a high GDP or can pay for these publication charges, then I'm not visible, right? Um, which then, then leads to being that maybe my work is not good enough, which is not true. Um, it's that there's a, another pain around that. And then when I also saw that, it, I thought uh, that from the data I, I was looking at, it, it felt to me that there was a reduced role for libraries, but actually there was a changing role that I, that, that I didn't understand at the time, which was that I thought libraries were there to curate and you know, manage help with search, discover things like that. But actually the libraries were spending a lot of time doing negotiations with publishers, um, lots of negotiations uh, consistently all the time, quite faithful. When you pull all those things together, what you eventually realize is that the current system in academia is not updated to what we need to do for our workflow, for open access, for open science, right? The things that we all do right now are within, are based on the past, is based on the digitalization of print rather than based on what we need now, you know? So if we could just take a moment and in the slide after this, uh, two slides after, we'll come to the discussion. If we could take a moment and we could think about what if we had all the resources, <laughs> we had all the time, we had all the expertise ready, what would the future of academia look like? And that's what we did when we started Cypher in 2018, but also presented this future and tried to test each and everything before we came up with these few points. So we tested it with libraries, with funders, with even publishers to see whether or not it, um, what they thought. We tested it with, uh, with uh, researchers who would think it was a bad idea. I went full out to people who didn't think uh, we should be in open access, wanted to stay and ask them what they thought before we came up with the company. And what we saw is that, first of all, back in 2018, I've been saying this now, I, I mean, now we know it's true. There should be no cost to publish and there should be no cost to access. Like you should not be paying APCs and it should be open access. That is our future. Let's all just hopefully agree to this because that's where we're going. <laughs> Um, the time to peer review, um, that all the redundancies with sending fragmented information over PDFs by emails, that should be all systematized and it should be easier for researchers to peer review and actually find joy in peer reviewing again. Or so not, not even again, but they should find joy in peer reviewing. It's one of the pivotal things about academia, being able to vet content. 
it should be cohesive. So the researchers, the funders, the tenure committees and the university admins are all part of the process of academia. So they should all be, they should coalesce within one system to allow for them to see this whole process instead of us having to send different CVs here and do this there. And we all know this is academia and, and as librarians, how much extra work. And it should be open up to the world. The university's brand and the researcher's brand should be seen directly. It shouldn't be under any other service or any other brand. It is your brand. It is your prestige. It is your integrity. The world should see you first. And the libraries should be there to preserve our content fully. Um, it, it is not an understatement what it, what it takes for the metadata and everything in the curation of content for a lifetime. So for example, if you have it published here in this system and the system doesn't exist anymore in 10 years, it is the library's charge to make sure that it lives on in perpetuity. When you pull all of these things together of what we thought the future should be, it becomes, I don't know if you see this, but for us, we saw that publishing becomes a service to academia, nothing else so that academic publishing is in service of, of academia and should be so. But that was me talking a lot for a couple of minutes. I'd like to bring it back to you here. And uh, what do you think about anything so far? <laughs> Doesn't have to be only what I said. Can you see me? Yeah. I bet you. Yeah. Um, I haven't got any responses in the chat yet or, or, or in the Q&A. Um, people have any comments to make about what Benny was just saying? Um, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, no, um, <laughs> if, I mean, I was just thinking about what you were saying around, and I completely agree that there should be kind of a shift in perceptions of prestige you know we all know that there's a real issue with kind of people being wedded to prestige associated with kind of you know the names of these big kind of players in academic publishing um and i think that is one of the biggest issues that we face how but how do we tackle that in terms of switching that narrative from focusing on those big publishers to the universities and making you know um changing like the perceptions that the people have how do we go about it people seeing libraries and universities in that way as opposed to seeing and we know it does happen with some you think about university of cambridge you know press and things like that but how do we how do we do it that's kind of one of the biggest I think pitfalls in academic publishing is the prestige element yeah we get asked a, a, a lot about this and you know it's just not it's just, it's a very hard question if you're thinking about the past and always assuming a yeah. prestige to be an academic publisher. But when you realize and look deeper is that we have lent our prestigious, our it's researchers' papers that have made, and it's researchers who are reviewing that have made those journals prestigious. Huh? Right, right. Why are they not doing that for the library or the library publishing systems and 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 things like that? What well, if I mean there are many researchers who've um, created journals and 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 things like that that have become quite prestigious in a short space of time. What I say, Holly, to be honest, I've said this to other libraries. I think it's it's more a personal thing right now because the policies are there. Everyone is looking at changing the metric systems. I know you signed up to Dora, you know, all these things are there. The question is, are we, are we, do, are we sure at the library and as researchers that we know our value? Mm -hmm. Or are we, are we not tired of other people taking that value, making something out of it? Are we not, are we not convinced in ourselves of how great we are? I mean, the world is as it is because of researchers and libraries. Absolutely. Google was made because of a library, a library. Yeah. So I, I, it is, it is, I mean, we have our way inside free of tackling that implementation. But as I said, I don't okay. really want to talk about, I really want to get to the core, which is like, if you know your value, nobody else could tell you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that is an issue, you know, and I know you've recently presented on this, haven't you, at a recent conference. But I think, you know, 
and it kind of is tied in a bit, I think in particular with libraries and librarians is kind of this hidden, we're kind of, we're almost like hidden. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of, that ties into this bigger issue around value of not necessarily how we feel about ourselves, but the value that others place on, on us. On you, know? you and yeah. therefore yeah. hide you, like hide it. Because the, yeah. what I said at that conference, like something that I see is really useful and that builds strength, like quiet strength, because we're not asking to go out there. I'm American and I have to speak for a living. <laughs> I would rather not, but like I would, uh, that quiet movement, which is like the librarian researchers having Fika together so they could know what each other is doing yeah. and recognize that like your workflow and your workflow are kind of hurting each other because the systems are in place that don't necessarily want us to help or haven't been built for us to help each other yeah and it starts ticking like just as a slow burn you know where you realize oh my god we're in this together you know but we don't need to be out there screaming and shouting I, I really think that we can see that internally from how you're doing here in Derby with the researchers and all the content you're doing yeah um yeah, just have Fika. Once you have like coffee time, you'll see your <laughs> your prestige. <laughs> um, um, we've got a question in the chat here or a comment from Catherine. I don't know if Catherine wants to um, unmute and yeah. ask a question to us. Um, no, I, I was just saying, sorry, okay. I don't want to, um, but I, uh, a, a colleague of mine went to um, a session the other day on Latin America and um, how they use their publishing system and how angry they are at us for going down the APC route and making it so difficult for everyone else to publish. And I just, I don't understand why we did go down the APC route and um, and I'm American as well. So I'm, <laughs> but I'm living in the UK and I'm just wondering, like hoping the US doesn't follow up, uh, the UK's model. Um, but yeah. Catherine, you know, it's funny you should say like, when we when we started in 20 what was that 2019 and they told us they were signing these APCs and we had to make the journal search tool I was like no first right because I was coming <laughs> as a researcher like no we're gonna but when you have a over the years I've started to like you know with the listening when you have a mandate from the government right and the government says you by 2021 you need to be a hundred percent open access and you have you have only one choice, which is to make a deal with a publisher. What other choice do you have? Nobody's using like we're not using all the other things that are there as researchers. Every researcher is still publishing, and a researcher will tell you now. Some of us in the open access movement and stuff will say, you know, we know what we're supposed to do, but we still want to publish in these journals. Comes back to Holly's talk about prestige. So when a librarian is sitting there with a governmental mandate that you have to move on, right? You can't, otherwise you don't get funded. Research is still published in these journals. P publishers giving you something, they it's like they had no choice. Now, that was years ago. So what Sweden has done, they've come all together and said it's not sustainable and they've just published their report of beyond transformative agreements. What they think is possible without signing, having now that they have done that and so on. So I know it's it's we say no, but sometimes we need to see what is what is being what pressure we're being put on and what options we really have. Um, in Latin America, they have been 100 percent open. And it's a shame that we didn't like look and follow their model and just build new um, library publishing, though. I think a lot of libraries did do their library publishing, but we uh, researchers were still publishing in these entities. It's not, it's not black or white at all. It's very gray and very difficult. But I know that now in Sweden and the rest of the uh, countries are looking beyond transformative agreements. So maybe Catherine, you'll see exactly what you want, which is no APCs much sooner than you think. Um, that was long. <laughs> Sorry. No, thank you. That was very good. <laughs> and I found the report as well. So I'll have a look. Yeah, good. good. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, it is. It, I think, you know, I don't want to keep harping on about this, but, you know, it depends on the institution as well. Obviously, you know, your money and kind of probably expectations about where you're supposed to spend that money. 
thinking about yeah. kind of li library projects and things, you know, and these read and publish agreements, we're kind of, you know, if we don't subscribe, then we yeah. won't have a lot of content for students and, and, and researchers and things. But then, you know, the other side of the coin is actually we've got a lot of stuff out there that's free in repositories and, you know, published in, on platforms that are free or so. I think you know we've also we've almost got into this position where it's like you say we're kind of acting on what we've always done and at some point we need to kind of break that kind of you know yeah um habitual nature really yeah. but it is yeah. easier said than done you know it's all it's all well and good of sitting here and saying that's the way we need to do it and we know we need to do it that way but you know how it's very difficult, isn't it, when faced with it in reality? Yeah, and I think, I mean, the libraries here make it very clear, like, we need to do it in steps. Yeah. And we need to do it together. And we can't, and no, and it's like, you know, Ohana, like, no one gets left behind. Sorry, I'm Disney. But there's a very, <laughs> there's a notion now I've seen in the last couple of years where it's less siloed. Like yeah. everybody's trying to talk to each other. I could see in Sweden, you know, you're moving over and saying, look, don't make the same mistakes that we made, you know, uh, that they made with uh, with these uh, agreements. And, you know, these read and publish agreements are very it's it's difficult. But I think like I'm seeing it moving in the right direction. The question I always ask is. How much more pain are we willing to take before we really move? Right. Like what more do we need to endure in academia? Um, the world has been begging for our content. People have, I, it's not that people don't wanna learn, it's just that they're learning from not us because everything else is open but academic content freely, completely and easy to find, you know? Yeah. How much more, how much more pain are we gonna take before we, what do we need? I feel like we need, um all the funders to say we're no longer going to support <laughs> APCs. <laughs> yeah. I think that's that coming. Have a huge think, effect, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that's coming. I think that's 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 I I actually think that's coming uh quite soon. I I I believe, but I think a lot of them, the funders in the libraries also want to hear from the they want to feel the groundswell also from researchers. They feel yeah, yeah. like you know that the researchers don't. And I just think that maybe as re uh, me as a researcher before, I didn't even realize what was happening. You know, I really feel like that FICA time and time together is necessary now with the yeah. library um, because I see the negotiations, I, you know, and, and researchers were trying as a researcher, you want to get grants just to get funding to make ends meet, you know? Yeah. The library wants to hear from them too. That's it. I think you're right. I think it really, I've, and I really think it has to come from the researchers. You know, there was a, a session um, last week, which some colleagues here might have been at, which was a rights retention session with Spark. Um, and Peter Suba was there, who's obviously like, you know, the godfather of open access. And he was saying, you know, we've had this rights retention policy at Harvard since 2008, but it really was faculty led. Yeah. And that's, he said, and, you know, that's when things take off, when researchers believe in it and researchers want it rather than yeah. it coming from the top down you know you need to do this you need to do that whether that be external funder requirements or internal policies yeah if it's if it's coming from the researchers themselves I think that's when things if researchers stopped going to APC journals if researchers yeah. stopped focusing on prestige yeah. that's when we'd see the massive change I think and I know there are lots of people that aren't focused on those things but I think there's a big percentage that still are yeah. so yeah we just have to keep help like you know saying that what that's what we believe and I think hopefully it kind of gets through at some point yeah and they're just answering openly I mean we see it with our work with the other universities you know when the library is there so I go because also I'm a researcher the researchers yeah. will meet yeah and we'll talk and then I obviously bring the librarians because I was like they need to meet you and you know, once you both there, like then the researchers start engaging and when they start understanding what green really means in embargo and they see you, then they then that ground swell starts to go, you know? So I really think, I mean, 
who is to say? I actually think that if we have more coffee, the world would change together. So more like tea time together. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see it happening. So, um, Catherine, oh, just, uh, yeah, Catherine, I don't know if you want to yeah. speak again, but yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't I don't think anything's gonna change until they stop using it in promotion. And yeah, like I, I used to work for a business school and they had a secret list they gave to all the PhDs uh, of all the journals. Yeah. They had they wanted them to publish and said, if you don't publish, you won't be hired. Yeah. And they have the cool. um but you Darby sent signed up to Dora, right? And then the Koara as well, too, right? Yeah, I think yeah, we did. We have. Yeah we are you know there are people we are committed to those things but I think like Catherine says we've still got pockets in in certain disciplines that say you know we use this list and and yeah. this is our list you know um and there's also you know this fixation on things around um star ratings from ref and things like that you know um um but you know it's it's difficult I think there are people that you know, we, they know where signatories of Dora, Kawara, etc. But it's kind of, um, you know, are people really aware what that means? I don't know. Or, or are they really no. thinking about that? I don't know. You know, it's it's in. I, I find I love. I so I know you called me in to do a talk, but I really wanted to do a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why is because when we who we were talking about when we we're talking to the universities, they were like, okay, we're gonna go 100% open access, and the next thing we need to deal with is the merit system <laughs> yeah. and how we do tenure and stuff. And so then I went interviewing all the funders or people who work as reviewers for funders, and I just asked them, you know, same question I asked everyone for everything else. But they started giving me feedback and it's like, you know, we're so busy. We have to use these journals as like a lazy way of assessing quality, right? It's like, th that's it, right? They, they're they so busy, lazy way. Okay, fine. All yeah. right, so then where is the data for everything else? So it's everywhere. So they're never gonna see how many reviews you've done because you might not, not publish a paper, but if you've reviewed 10 papers, you definitely help the ecosystem and you should yeah. be part right they're not seeing how much teaching you're really doing in terms of your impact you know that you do the tweeting you do the stuff that you do outside of your home where's right. all that information that your colleagues know where is it right? right so that's why when we were building dynamic we we're like okay you need to make this information available to the funders because before they can change they need to see the data right, right. and they need to see it coming from the university and from the researcher themselves Otherwise, they can't change because they're busy. Everybody is busy. Everybody's yeah. busy. <laughs> Too busy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about, you know, there's the um, Koki Open Knowledge Initiative and they've got kind of, you know, they use lots of open data sources to tell stories about, you know, the way that open access is kind of performing at universities and things like that and uh, um, different countries. It'd be great to have something like that for other things that people do, <laughs> you know. Um like you were just saying kind of who's meant is there a way of kind of measuring who's mentoring people who's doing other things beyond publishing in journals you know yeah. but yeah. how I mean I don't know how that would happen how you would kind of quantify it that's that, that's the difficult thing isn't it people are looking kind of for some sort of quantification of something which they can then say like you say this means this this means quality yeah whereas other things like mentoring like I don't know um yeah. exhibits and things like that how how is that quantified and how do people actually see it as a tangible thing I think that's that yeah. plays a big part in kind of um how people see things and uh, kind of um see them as valuable as well yeah and I think what you're doing here today and what will happen in the rest of the week, like I hope everyone just questions be instead of like, oh, we want this, oh, we want that. Like just question the thing that you're seeing right now because the more you question, the more you start realizing what fits and what doesn't fit. And I mean, we're researchers, I mean, what am I saying? Treat this like we treat our research, question it. Why are we still um, looking at these journals for prestige? Why Why are we so busy? What What are all the different things that we have to do now that they didn't have to do before? Yeah. Um, you know, wh why is it we can't focus? What's, what's missing from our lives to help us focus? It's, 
I questioned a lot of that before I transitioned to starting Cyfree and I built the company in order for us to focus, in order for me to focus, for example, on academia, right? There were just too many things that wasn't serving us in academia that, right. you know, like at the end of the day, I did all of that work and my only value was a published paper. I was like, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, it is not easy, but I, I do know that in Sweden in particular, and I do and I see other universities like the USA, they're coming over to Sweden to, to learn. And then I see works that are happening in the UK as well uh, with different preservation units. And of course the work you're doing where they're looking at one beyond transfer, transformative agreements, rights retention policies and your repositories and your data management, that's that's all moving very quickly and very sustainably, I believe. Um, and then also what's next uh, for metrics? Yeah, that's coming up. So I think uh, it's going to be fun. It's 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 I wouldn't be worried um, and it, just because I build software for it. But that's <laughs> not <fun. laughs> anyway, if there's, if there's a, <laughs> is there any other question or comment before we just close off or does anybody want to say anything else or there's nothing else in the chat um and i don't think i can say anything in the q a at the moment but we might have some more questions at the end oh sorry oh, awesome. george 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 please speak please speak up hi uh, can you hear me yes brilliant i'm really sorry if i missed this um my connection's <laughs> Was a bit spotty. Okay. But, um, I think it's. I think you were talking earlier about um, the need for things to come from the, the ground up and and things like that, which is is obviously you know very sensible. Um, you were also mentioning earlier the issue of established prestige and, and trying to overcome the idea of you know journal publication is everything. I feel like the, one of the main barriers, though, is this: the actual publishers themselves. Obviously, if we can get people to be disinterested in in, in publishers, um, and you know, find other ways of achieving what they feel to be prestige, that'd be you know, the answer. But in the meantime, publishers obviously have a very vested commercial interest in trying to keep researchers Absolutely. engaged with them, and yes. <clears throat> with money is also often uh, influence and, and power in terms of like government. Uh, interactions and things like that yeah. and I, I i really don't know what the best solution is in terms of overcoming that uh, it would be great if all of the money that is going towards publishers could be reinvested elsewhere into more equitable platforms yeah. and and things like that but I, I i i struggle to visualize what the solution is for that do you do you have any thoughts about that a lot, but I'll try to bring it down. <laughs> I think it's great that you you bring that up and like everyone is yeah. honest about that deep seated interest that is um, holding us back, maybe or holding the movement back. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's in any industry. <laughs> this is not just our industry, right? As I mentioned, uh, Sweden with the the beyond transformative agreements and things like that, uh, they are very much adamant about not paying publishers and moving that money back into researchers' salaries. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? They went out and tested other services, and then we were part of that service, and then also tested a suitability and sustainability. So they wanted to see twenty years ahead, what is what is this going to cost us and things like that, right? So I think that from, from top, they're working on it. I believe other libraries are doing the same. In consortia, they're doing that. From a researcher standpoint, I don't know. And that's what I asked, like, what do we need? Because if all researchers stopped publishing in those venues and there was another venue with the university library or archives, however, if you stopped publishing, they would lose their ability and power to control this ecosystem. That's not gonna happen. Why? <laughs> I would wonder, but George, I don't, I don't know. I know the top are trying their best to create the publishing um, wings from library publishing and everything so that you can have an alternative. But if we keep submitting and keep paying for it, they will still be there. So 
I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, and I try not to be against anything because I do think that library publishers, especially and so on, they digitalize so much content. Yeah, but, but things them. like that are more likely to listen to. Yeah. Oops, sorry. I think my connections caused me sorry, to. Sorry, go ahead. I was waiting sorry. for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was just saying, yeah, that there seems that there's a political dimension to it as well in terms of uh, more conservative governments being more likely to just side with uh, the commercial interests. Um, but I, I seem to remember that when there was discussion uh, some time ago about the, the growth of rights retention strategies in the UK, one of the things that publishers were kind of saying was, why should we care what you guys want in the UK when you're just such a small portion of our overall kind of market? Um, and what people were kind of saying was that if if the US, which is probably one of the biggest mm -hmm. things, and China as well, growing yeah. um, source of research outputs, if the governments of those two massive countries can make this shift, uh, then publishers are much more likely to kind of be to to listen to that. But both of those cases, you've got, I guess, potentially extremes of of, of political. Um, standpoints, but both are going to be equally hard to convince to take that approach, I think. And I, I, yeah, I just don't know what the solution is there. No, I, I think it's going to come from the libraries working together. So it, I, I really believe that like when you have a library in the UK, library in the US and library in Sweden, whatever, working together, that's a big chunk of researchers that they're taking care of. And when they're working together, no longer in silo, they can actually push towards the government and things like that, especially bigger libraries too, and even smaller libraries that don't have so much. Yeah, maybe don't underestimate the power of the library and the researchers. If they all, if they're sitting down there in silo and they're saying that they want X, do not under, underestimate that power. George, honestly, don't underestimate it. I'm sitting in meetings when they listen to, and they do listen to researchers. They really, it just, we need to voice it. They need to voice this. Yeah. And yeah, so don't underestimate that at all in this, in this week. Thank you very much for that kind yeah. of positive message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be difficult. It can be a bit, you know, it can become quite cynical almost, particularly around, you know, the publishers and their power. And, but like, if we look at the OSTP memo, right, there is kind of, and, you know, Johan Rorick from Coalition S has said this, there is or in that the implications that a rights retention, there's a, you know, a rights retention element to that kind of memo as well. So, it's, and that is obviously coming from the top, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's an incredibly difficult thing to kind of unpick and, and to see Sometimes it's hard to kind of see a, a light at the end of the tunnel almost, you know. <laughs> On that, Holly, I have a last bit because I was okay. wondering yeah, what would happen definitely. with this discussion. So I wanted to end <laughs> this off. And it, it turned out exactly as I thought, actually. So that's interesting. <laughs> We're all doomed. So, um, no, no, no. <laughs> no, so... Um, I, I left a bit out here with the rights retention, but obviously metrics and prestige is, is the key point in these APCs, as uh, Catherine, I hope I said it right, uh, mentioned, and then George, of course, with the rights retention and us working together. But coming back, in order to substantiate that positive message, I'd like to just uh, offer something, some advice that I had gotten when I was surfing and doing a lot of stuff, is to look at this notion called ikigai both personally and organizationally. So the idea with Ikigai is to sit down and write what you love, write what the world needs or what you think the world needs, write down what you're good at, and then write down what you can get rewarded for or paid for. When you have just these two, so just your mission and passion, you can feel excited, but financially uncertain. When you have just passion and profession and profession there, sometimes you feel satisfaction, but sometimes you could feel useless. I mean, that's kind of how I felt before I changed into Cyfree. I felt a bit useless, I'll, I'll be honest. Not anymore. But now when you have profession and vocation, you could feel some comfort because you're getting paid, but you could be a bit hollow, feel a bit hollow. And then with only mission and vocation, you're excited, but then you can become complacent and it can lead to uncertainty. 
But if you look at all four of these things together, and if you write them down, you could actually see a red thread. And that red thread with these four things together is your ikigai or your reason for being. Once you spend the time to get really clear and on our website, and I'll also share this with, um, with Holly so that you have this uh, going on and how to do it. Once you get really clear about these four things, you get clear about where you put your time and spend your time. And you'll actually see things changing quite rapidly, even before your eyes. I would have never been able to tell you that I would have started a company and be here talking to you now with 50 customers all over the world or anything else like that. It came necessarily from other things, but also from doing this and getting very, very clear about what we need to do next. With that all being said, I'd like to thank the University of Derby and Essex for inviting us here. I'd like to wish you all the very, very best and thank you for your time. Um, all the best for the Open Access Week ahead. And as we say in our community, Open Access 365 24 seven. And thank you again. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs> Thanks so much, Benny. That was great. Um, and yeah, I think I, I, I'm sure a lot of us in the room looking at the icky guy at the end can kind of relate to loads of those, you know, kind of feeling useless or powerless. But, you know, knowing that it's the right thing to do and knowing that we're doing we're, what we're doing, what we're working towards is good. And it's kind of, you know, where we should be headed. But it can get frustrating and you can feel as though what you're doing is not really having an, an impact. Yeah. Um but yeah, I think that's really, really useful to see that. Um, haven't got any more questions in the Q and A or anything. Does anybody have any questions for Benny or um, comments? I'd love to hear from you. We've got about ten minutes of the session left. If you're okay to hang on for a little bit longer, Benny. Yeah, yeah. I prefer to discuss. Holly, I'm going to send. Um, you're sharing the slides as well, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to send with everyone if they want to just take a moment like we have a because we usually do this both personally, but also like in the organization, I'll send the the worksheet of how to do the Ikigai yourself so that everyone could just awesome. download it and um, try it on your friends as well, too. It's fun to see. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about, you know, when we met a few months back when we were talking about this talk and I could ask to speak and we were kind of, it feeds into some of the discussion that we've been having today around, uh, you know, how commercialization has really become synonymous with ah. negativity, shall we say, and kind of predatory behavior, particularly when we're thinking about the academic publishing industry. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that, because obviously Cyfree is a commercial entity. Um, mm -hmm. And I just kind of thought, I just wanted to know more about how you're trying to distance yourself away from that kind of notion of, you know, an academic publisher being kind of this thing, this thing that's just out there to make money and it's not interested really in the kind of like benefit and research in society, you know. Just your thoughts on it, really? Yeah, I I struggled a lot with mm -hmm. this, and I like I didn't even want to address it because, from I'll just say personally, for me, it felt like we were asking a question or demanding something based on the past. Like we were we we're just mad. We're mad at what the publishers have done. But if you not but and if you look at how they run their business and everything else like that. They have been very open and honestly honest about what their stakeholders and what their shareholders want or anything like that. They never really lie to us, you know. Mm -hmm. You could find paper clippings from 1998 with Reed Elsevier saying, like, you know, academics are not publishers, you know. So I'm I'm very much focused on getting the momentum moving and getting us off our seats to demand more for ourselves rather than worrying about the past, right? Yeah. Now, for Cyfree as a commercial entity, we have several things in place. First of all, I, when I started Cyfree, uh, Vinova, our granting agency, made me for profit because Sweden thrives on what? Taxes. So I have to make sure I'm paying the utmost amount of taxes. 
we have a board and we run in consensus. And also, I didn't want to create a service that had no value that our customers weren't using consistently. And I didn't have enough money to redevelop because I know this is a long term project. There's right. going to be more things. I need to have more revenue. I need to make sure that the customers is saving money. Otherwise, why would they buy our services? Right. Right. So I for me, it look I look at commercialization in terms of whether or not I am as Cyfree, as the leader of Cyfree, as a product owner, am I adding any value into this world? Are the customers, am I relieving any pain? If I'm not, right. what's the point? Right? So that that's how I look at it. And we talked a little bit about that. And I know it's a hard topic. I shy away from it because I just don't feel, I feel like we should be focusing on, on, how are we moving this needle forward? We already know this. It's been there. <laughs> it's, yeah. <you> know? <laughs> I suppose also it's um, beating the publishers at their own game. <laughs> like, you you know, we kind of talked about this. You, need, we yeah. all, you know, we need somebody to actually be bigger <laughs> than them. Yeah. So it can kind of like, yeah, this is how it's going to be now. We're the kind of biggest player and we've established a new norm. So I suppose, yeah. I but mean, you that's know probably what? a long way off. But... Maybe I get in trouble for saying this, Holly. You know, publishers like take librarians away and put them into sales roles and things like that. You know, could you imagine if we were no. coming together as libraries and it's like all of us together? We would be bigger than that. I'm sorry, we are bigger than them. Yeah, we are definitely bigger than than that. We just need to come together and stop being in silo. We need researchers to also come together. We can start within our university, within the department, and then we come together in consortia. And then it's not yes. an issue. We create value for each other all the time. Yes. And I'm Very sorry, true. that 25 billion that the publishers are making that is saying, my question is always, why are why is that money not coming back into academia? Yeah, right, right. Right? That's right. So that's why I think that money should come back into academia. But I'm very extreme. I'm very sorry. <laughs> so I didn't mean to. I want to keep it positive. I believe that money should be in academia. I do too. I think <laughs> many of us here would also agree. Yeah. Um, Let's make know. it so. But yeah, well, we've got we just got to carry on, haven't we? Fighting the good fight, as it were. And as you're doing here, and thank you everyone for being here. And I'm pretty sure that you um, by the end of the week, you're going to have thoughts and implementation steps of how we're going to take this fight further. Absolutely. And make it more fun. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much again. It's been wonderful. And I um, hope you have a great rest of day, Ebony, and everybody that's joined us. If you do any follow up questions for Ebony, I'm sure she would be happy to answer them offline. Um, yes. And yeah, thanks for coming along to the first session of Open Access Week. All the best. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, Benny. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.